Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Mentoring Moments. I'm here with Kevin Zoll once again, and he's got some great questions lined up for me today. Kevin, over to you. What are your questions for me today? I appreciate it. So I wanted to understand, you know, what I should be learning as my next like learning target for the next year. So when I started my career journey, I was primarily a CPQ expert, and then I moved into B2B commerce. My thought process was that I want to learn a new field domain in case one or the other was not as valuable anymore. And also a field domain that would be pretty relevant to each other. A lot of times when customers are considering a CPQ solution, they're also considering a B2B commerce solution and so on. I think the value of me working at an enterprise organization that focuses on a lot of different types of domains, such as marketing or supply chain management or ERP, I'm trying to get a general career advice in terms of what is the new field I I could be learning that would be valuable to me in, in my career growth. Yeah, look, I think there's always value in seeing our industry through as many lenses as possible. So I, when I first started out, had my own e-commerce peer play, also worked in an agency. Then after seven years of having my own e-commerce peer play, then I went into agency land, did that for a few years, went back into working for merchants, then went back into agency land, then now have my own consultancy. So I feel like I've been able to see the market through multiple lenses and multiple angles. And one of my most valuable experiences was actually working brand side for a very massive brand, but they were a medium sized brand and staying with the company long enough to see all of the systems and architecture that I did come to fruition. So instead of being a theorist, a run and gun consultant, an agency that comes in, maybe does some strategic work and gets out again, actually going in, working inside of a brand long enough to, we replatform when I was at Health Post, <clears throat> we replatformed every single piece of commerce technology we had in the time that I was there. We replatformed, uh, we replatformed e-commerce, we replatformed system integration, we replatformed our WMS, which was bespoke originally, and we implemented PeopleVox, we, re- we, we replaced our ERP system, we implemented a CRM for the first time, we implemented a PIM for the first time. So like we replatformed the, you know, everything that I had historically architected into a client engagement as an agency before, now I was in the thick of actually having to go through the entire process of being an implementation specialist inside of a brand and having to live with that over two, three years worth of implementation. We re, we implemented new marketing automation platform. We, we just, there was so much work we did over that time that instead of it being theoretical and say, even as an agency partner, even if I had architected all those solutions into a brand, we as an agency partner for e-commerce wouldn't have implemented that whole entire stack. We would have maybe done the e-commerce implementation and maybe system integration with all those other systems, but we wouldn't have done the ERP implementation. We wouldn't have done the CRM implementation. We wouldn't have done the PIM implementation. Those were all done by different partners. And as a result of that, I got to see firsthand the consequences and the benefits of my architecture and my recommendations back to the business. So I was the one that spearheaded the entire search and select process for all of those components in the stack. I was the one that did the high level solution architecture of how all these uh, solutions would tie together, what the data flows would be, how we would service the warehouse system because we had an owned warehouse. We weren't working with 3PL. We had our own warehouse. So we had to think about things like, okay, how are we going to re-architect our warehouse? We put in a carousel system to take products from the back of the warehouse to the front of the warehouse. We like we re-architected just kind of everything from business processes to organizational design to systems to data architecture. Just Absolutely everything changed in the three plus years that I was inside this business. And I was helping the business put together the testing plan. I was helping the business put together. I was helping to bring everybody in in the business together. I literally went and sat inside every single department head in the business to understand 
what they did, how they did it, what they loved about their job, what they hated about their job, what was working, what wasn't working. So instead of just doing discovery around e-commerce, now I was doing discovery around absolutely every business team and every function in the entire business. And that was the first time I'd ever had to do that before. And it was so eye-opening and so enlightening to understand how all the puzzle pieces fit together in a circa $50 million a year privately owned organization with its own warehouse and its own distribution capabilities. And it was, it was a massive learning experience. But then again, when I worked in the agency space, that was massive learning because now instead of working and, and going deep with one individual client, now I'm working across a massive range of clients with different business models, different go-to-markets, different UVPs, different default system stacks that we're now having to work with and integrate with and potentially replace components of or recommend replacements of components of. I, I said all that to say that I think if I look back across my career, it is the variety of experience that I've had and that unique set of skill stacking that I've had that has made me the well-rounded, I think the extremely well-rounded consultant that I am today. And any scenario, I think that either gives you the chance to learn or gives you the chance to earn, but especially early in your career, I would emphasize learning over earning early in your career. And a lot of times I find that people that are early in their career, they go to work for some large company, some large corporate, and they almost give themselves golden handcuffs because they become accustomed to that income, they become accustomed to that lifestyle, and it's really hard to go backwards financially, even if you have an opportunity to go into a learning environment that will dramatically accelerate your learning. So when I think about going into Health Post, I'll be honest, that was a step back financially for me. That, that, that was not – I was not maximizing. When I took the job at Health Post, I was not maximizing for earning. I was maximizing for learning. And when I started there, I knew they had this entire massive roadmap. I didn't know all the things that they were going to do, but I knew that they had a significant roadmap of work that they wanted to achieve inside the business in terms of digital transformation, business transformation, system transformation. I, I knew going in that – so the, the CEO was the son of the founders of the company, and he was – Prior to me coming there, he wanted to move into the, or he had moved into the CEO role, but previously had been the e commerce manager in the business. And so he was looking for someone to replace him. And so I was, I, I, there was two things. One is there was a massive uh, roadmap of work, as I said, but secondarily, as the e commerce manager, I was going to be uh, answering directly to the CEO. And I had no one above me except the CEO, and he came from my role. And so I knew that there was going to be, there was huge importance placed on e-commerce in this business and digital transformation in this business because of who was now leading the company. And I knew that stuff was all going to get given priority. And he understood the name of the game was to stay modernized digitally and to not have tech debt build up in the business. And so I knew going in that there was going to be an opportunity to do so go from a theorist to a doist. And I knew I was going to be able to do that within the context of this business. And I knew that if I could stick this out for two, three, four years long enough to do this massive digital transformation program inside the business, and obviously it wasn't just me, there was other people in the business that were involved in this, but me spearheading that digital transformation movement right throughout every division and department of the business. I knew that if I could stick that out, that would serve me well for the rest of my career because I saw when I looked around, I looked at consultants and I looked at agencies and I looked at different specialists in the industry and lots and lots of them had no practical real world experience inside merchants themselves. They had no real world experience. They were all theorists, meaning that they were, they were run and gun consultants or they were doing some basic consulting as part of an agency engagement where they would deliver one small piece of work and but everything else was delivered by others. And so being able to have the vision to pull all that together and work through the massive highs and lows, because I tell you, it, it's hard when you're basically in project mode for two, three years, it's, it, it fatigues people. It, it tires them out because you're just, you're in this constant state of flux 
Everybody's trying to get their job done on a day-to-day -day basis. There's some people that are really anti-change. They just want to come in, do their job and leave. And so you got to, you got to be a cheerleader. You got to keep the vision. You got to fly the flag. You got to keep painting the picture as people come and go out of the business. You got to keep telling them, this is what we're driving towards people. This is the vision. This is the end goal. And I know it seems tough now, and I know it is tough now. However, when we get to the promised land, all this stuff, all this pain is going to be worth it. And here's why. And you have to keep reinforcing that picture over and over again. You got you to reinforce it for yourself too, because sometimes you get as the primary cheerleader of digital transformation in the business, it's tiring. It's tiring, right? And so uh, I said all that to say that I think any place where you can get hands-on practical experience with some of this stuff and the, the broader range of scenarios you can expose yourself to the better. And so I, I would say you look super young. I don't, I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing you're quite young. I, I would say too many people I see come into our industry, optimize for earning too early in their career, and they short circuit their learning opportunities because maybe the best learning opportunity would cut their income in half. Right. And so I, that's the primary piece of advice I would give is optimize for learning early on in your career as, as much as possible. And then you can opt you can always optimize for earning later. You can always you can you, you can always go back and work for a big corporate later in your career. You can always go out and be a consultant making three hundred dollars an hour. You can always you can always for God's sake, you can always go and work for a bank or an insurance company that are going to pay you two, three, four hundred thousand uh, dollars a year working in their IT team or working in their digital team. So the, the reality is the opportunities will always be there to optimize for earning. But my advice is skill stack as hard out as you can early in your career so that you have the broadest um, range of skills as you advance in your career. Because all, like when I think about it, I offer services to four core groups of people now, right? It's merchants, it's investors, it's agencies, and it's platform vendors, right? I wouldn't feel confident offering services to that four, those four groups of people if I didn't have the skill stack and the experience set that I have. I, I would maybe only feel comfortable providing services to merchants. But because I've had experience across a broad range of scenarios in our industry over the last 20 plus years, I feel extremely confident going in and giving advice to these different four co cohorts of, of potential customers. And so I think just have a really long-term view of where you ultimately maybe see yourself ending up. I know it's hard to say in 10 years time, I'm going to be here, but just give yourself as much optionality as you can. And the only way to give yourself optionality is to give yourself a broad breadth of experience. That's what I would say. Gotcha. I, I appreciate the advice. I definitely agree with you. It's definitely important to prioritize learning as early as you can, because that's going to set you up for a much more successful future later on. Yeah. This leads me really well to my next questions. From my experience, a lot of customers that value when they are interested in B2B commerce technologies, they oftentimes want to talk about integration between ERP and supply chain management. And those are technologies I'm trying to become more familiar with. Um, typically, I find that when someone's trying to get into those type of fields, I think they have to go to college for that. They, get a, they, they have to get a degree in that supply chain management type degree. I'm not trying to figure out how do I enable on those technologies without having to go to college for it. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe I have to go to college for it. Maybe I have to have some sort of hands-on experience. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out what can I do to be able to get in type of space as a, as a B2B commerce like practitioner. Yeah, look, I didn't go to university. I, I took a couple of classes at a local local community college, but I didn't get a degree. And I don't think it is – I'm a very much an autodidactic learner. So as a result of that, I prefer to learn in my own way, and I prefer to learn things that are important in the moment in my career. I prefer to dig deep into technologies as and when needed. The, our industry is changing so fast. That sure, if I maybe if I was going to go into supply chain specialization and I was going to work there for my whole career, maybe I'd think about doing a degree, or maybe I'd think more about doing like a, a trade program or something like that, where I was getting an, an, an on-the-job placement or uh, something like that. But I, I, I don't think that in our space you necessarily have to have. Obviously, if 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 what you're going into, if you're going to be a programmer or something like that, maybe you need some heavy mathematics stuff, but 
I, I don't even think with, with, especially with co-pilots on things nowadays, I don't think you necessarily need to go to, to university. I don't think you necessarily need to have a computer science degree. I don't think you need to necessarily have a business systems degree to be able to succeed very well in our industry, right? <clears throat> maybe it'll help. Maybe it'll open stores. Maybe some bigger corporates require you to have at least a bachelor's kind of thing, or they won't even look at you, or they won't even look at your CV kind of thing. I'm sure that if I went to apply for a large corporate because I don't have a degree, they might just put me in the too hard pile and I wouldn't even qualify for a look in. I don't know. But I, I think that equivalent experience is really important in our industry. And I see lots of people that come out with business systems degrees or computer science degrees, and they don't necessarily have the flexibility of learning uh, all about these new things that are coming down the pipe every single day in our industry like I do. Because maybe they have a slightly more rigid way of looking at the world, right? Because of maybe what they've learned. I have a super flexible way uh, of looking at the world because I've seen all sorts of crazy implementations. Some work, some don't. Some work better than others. But they all kind of work enough to allow these businesses to continue to transact in the world. And so sometimes when I go in, I'm like, wow, okay, this architecture is definitely not what I would have thought was the ideal architecture for this type and scale of business, but it works. But let's look at ways we can optimize this and maybe plug and replace individual components as required. And let's, let's not boil the ocean with this project. Let's look at one component at a time. Let's try to create an overall roadmap that makes sense commercially to the business, but gets them from point A to point B. And in two to three years, this is a dramatically improved business from process perspective and from a system perspective, from a data perspective, this is a dramatically improved business over a two to three to four year window, but we're not going to boil the ocean in month one or month six or month 12. And so I said all that to say that, especially with supply chain, the tech is so good now. If we look at something as simple, when I was at Health Post, we implemented PeopleVox. It's got chaotic put away. It's a relatively lightweight WMS compared to something like Manhattan, for example, which is real heavyweight. It's tier one WMS, OMS, whereas I consider PeopleVox and systems of that ilk to be like a tier two WMS, but it works fantastic for retail. Like it's, it's, it's cost effective. Uh, it has native integrations with lots of ERPs, including NetSuite, which is very popular, and, and D365. It's got native integrations with the, the core ERP platforms that we see in the retail space. It's got some high-end features without the high-end price tag of the Manhattan. It really automates that pick-pack dispatch process. It, it helps you optimize warehouse space using systems like Chaotic Put-Away, pick to light uh, and all sorts of other all sorts of other systems that, that really you would normally only see in really high-end systems. Is it perfect? No. Does it have all of the high-end features of a Manhattan? No. But I think the technology is advancing so fast that you, you, it, as long as you can pick up technology quickly, then you can really start to understand how these technologies fit in with a broader uh, business stack that you can optimize for that specific brand. And I think that, sure, you could go to university for supply chain management if you were going to become, I don't know, let's say you were going to manage a logistics business or you're going to work for a freight broker or you were going to become a warehouse manager or you were going to manage all of supply chain and procurement for a large brand or something like that. Then I could maybe see a business case for going to university and getting like supply chain management degree and understanding like the nuances of demand planning and how to do that manually as well as using technology and all that sort of stuff. But I, I get the sense that you're like me in that you swing more towards and as opposed to swinging more towards the bent of marketing or pure marketing capabilities within a business, you're swinging more towards the technical and operational side of a business. And that's exactly me. You've exactly described me and who I am. So I understand the importance and power of marketing. I understand most of the major marketing concepts. I understand where technology has to provide all of the data and services to a marketing team for them to be able to be effective and where data has to come into the business, where data has to go out of the business, I understand CDPs, marketing automation platforms and the like. But I'm not going to go and help a brand run campaigns, right? That's just not, that's not me. I help them operationalize marketing capabilities and tools within their business to be able to help them be more efficient as marketers within the business. And I help them understand that overlap between marketing skills and capabilities and tooling and data. And so this is where I add value. And I think that 
it feels like you're on a similar pathway, maybe not identical to me, but certainly on a similar pathway. And you have one string to your bow that I didn't, which is I didn't get to be and start understanding B2B until much later in my career. And that, and, and that made sense because B2B, particularly B2B e-commerce, really wasn't in vogue 24 years ago. It just wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Like B2B at best, we're doing like EDI. Punch out really wasn't even that popular back then. So really it's only been in the last five to 10 years that B2B e-commerce has become a real serious thing. And the technologies out there have come down in price enough to where even small and mid-sized B2B brands can offer B2B e-commerce to their customers. That's really only become viable in the last five to 10 years. And whilst I wish I had maybe doubled down on this and maybe understood manufacturing, wholesale distribution earlier in my career, I picked it up pretty quick. And so the reality is you do have a string to your bow and you are in the industry at a time that I think is super exciting and the opportunities have never been better to really double down on that B2B knowledge, skill set, and capability because of the opportunity over the next 10 years. I, again, I think this transitioned really well to my next question. This is more of a B2B platform type of questions from what I see online with a lot of B2B commerce platform companies, a lot of the functionality, truthfully, with like these platforms can be very similar to each other. Obviously, depending on the different companies, there are different value points, such as maybe the integrations being easier between the other tech stacks the companies have, or if the company has the CRM, then the integration is easier between that. But I haven't seen as much feature and functionalities be pretty unique between different platforms. Maybe I'm not doing enough research enough, but what have, you, have you seen any sort of features between between different platforms that are pretty unique amongst other vendors? Yeah, definitely. There are, once you get into the nitty gritty and the nuances of B2B, there are a lot of use cases and edge cases that might be edge, seem like edge cases, but then once you get into the industry a little bit more, this is actually reasonably common. You get into scenarios where you, you even look at somebody like a Shopify, for example, and they've got B2B on Shopify now, but they've really only been adding features around B2B and the data primitives around B2B for the last six, uh, 12 to 18 months. And so you look at a lot of the what we would consider baseline features in a B, that you would expect to see in a B2B platform that don't exist in, in, in Shopify yet. And I'll just give you two. You can't upload a CSV of an order through the front end of B2B on Shopify to populate a cart, for example. And that's, very, that's a very bog standard expectation in the B2B world. Okay, I've got a CSV of my order. I'm going to upload that through the front end. That populates my cart, and then I'm going to check out. That, that's a really standard expectation. Also, a super uh, standard expectation is per, unique permission set by user within a buying organization. So um, in the B2B world, my customer is an organization. It's a business. It's not an individual user. It's not an individual buyer. And I need to have, be able to have hierarchical control over which tier of buyer within that organization can do what thing. So uh, many times there's a senior buyer, a junior buyer, a procurement specialist, and then usually there's somebody who finally has to authorize all purchases, right? And that needs to go through a workflow process of, okay, cool, maybe I can add things to cart. Maybe I can create shopping lists for different areas of the business, but I can't, and, and maybe I can create these purchase lists or these POs within the system, but I need a procurement person to actually authorize each order, for example. And Shopify, you can have multiple accounts nested multiple user accounts nested underneath the main buying organization, but there's no permission control within that, right? They're all treated the same. They all have the exact same authority. They can all make purchases, right? And so there's no workflow engine inside Shopify unless you wanted to build something custom out in flow, which you might be able to do because the data primitive of users is there. Maybe you could do something out, out there with flow in the checkout or something like that. But the you know without some external app or microservice to control the permission set, you have no way of controlling the workflow for checkout for different users within an organization. And so th there are, once you start getting into the nuances, every one of these B2B businesses, that, that is one of the key differences between B2B and B2C is that in B2B, there, the, every business is so wildly different in their requirements that you can't even say, unlike the B2C world, whereas – in the BC world, you might be able to say, okay, when you're at this revenue level, go and implement Shopify, Klaviyo, Gorgeous, and Zero or QuickBooks in the back end, right? Okay, here's a stack. 
when you're up to X millions. When you're up, then when you grow above that, then maybe replace this with this. When you go up to this next level, here's a design pattern. When you go up to the next level, here's a common design pattern. In B2B, there are not a lot of common design patterns that can work across all B2B business types at these different tiers of growth because they are so different. And also very rarely, even when you come across a manufacturer, very rarely are they just a manufacturer. They're also usually a wholesaler or distributor of other things that they don't make, but that make a complete package of solutions around the piece of thing that they manufacture. And I use this example a lot. Okay, you're a company that manufactures pumps, but you don't make the piping and the plumbing and the valves and all the other, the, if you're supplying breweries or food and beverage or something, you don't maybe supply the fermentation tanks. You don't supply, there's lots of things you may not supply, even if you manufacture pumps, but you want to go to market with a full solution stack that you can sell to a customer. And so therefore, maybe 20% of your catalog you manufacture and the other 80% you're a wholesaler distributor for. And so you either have to bring in products that you warehouse to go out with your pumps or some things you may ship from your own warehouse and then the other components you may drop ship via as a distributor. You push that order out to the other manufacturers, suppliers of the other components. So there's just so many unique use cases and business models in the B2B world that I, there's just no one size fits all. And so when I, that is part of what my job is, is to help brands. Once I go in and I do this deep dive discovery and I understand all the nuances of their business model, I understand the nuances of their existing tech stack. I understand the limitations of their existing data sets. And we try to fix those before we ever do anything else. I understand the limitations of their integration architecture, et cetera. Then and only then can I help them with search and select for components of their stack that need replacing or upgrading or implementation for the first time through the lens of an 80-20 fit. And by that, can we find a solution out there that does 80%, meets 80% of your requirements out of the box without customization? And I, I can only do that once I really know the business inside and out. So you, you're, you've nailed it. B2B is more complex. And on the surface, a lot of these platforms look very similar. But once you get under the bonnet, what they do and how they do it can be wildly different. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. I appreciate it. My first question, just understanding more around what EDI is. From my previous experience, I've heard a lot of enterprise companies say they want to use EDI for their large accounts, large enterprise accounts, while they're maybe open like a B2B storefront for their smaller custom, mid-market customer. So I wanted to get your understanding around what, what is EDI? Absolutely. So fantastic question. And specifically as it relates to B2B commerce, EDI is it's electronic data interchange, but it's an umbrella term for any completely automated end-to-end -end system that allows buyers and sellers to interface with each other. EDI can be used for lots of different things outside the commerce sphere as well, but specifically in relation to B2B commerce, there are three primary ways that, that B2B sellers engage with B2B buyers from a digital perspective. EDI punch out self-service e-commerce. So let's start at the top. Let's start with EDI, which is the one you're asking about. So this allows, there's a protocol and there's, there's not just, a lot of people think there's one EDI protocol. There's many that are popular around the world. EDI is circa 30 plus years old. So it's a very ancient way for buyers and sellers to interface with each other, but it was originally designed to allow a buyer's ERP to generate a PO and send that through directly into the seller's ERP and generate an SO to generate a sales order it's for them to then fulfill. And it was largely hands-off, 100% computer-driven integration was, well, there was multiple ways to do the actual integration, but there are specific EDI protocols that are common around the world. Europe has their own favorites. North America has their own favorites. Latin America has their own favorites. There's multiple EDI protocols. But there are usually EDI middleware platforms specifically designed to translate the data from the P 
PO to the receiver system uh, into an SO. And so it has to understand both ERPs, it has to understand the data structure, has to understand the syntax, has to understand the mapping. And that's basically what EDI is. It's a completely automated way to get the purchase order and create it as a sales order in the target system and allow that to be fulfilled in an automated way. Now, whether the PO is automatically generated on the buyer side is th there's multiple ways to go about that. Sometimes there's min max rules, for example, of a specific inventory item that automatically trigger the creation of PO or aggregation of when, let's say across a catalog for that specific supplier, the, the minimum is reached across 10 products one day, 20 products, the next day, 30 products, the next day, sometimes what they'll do is they'll aggregate over a given week or a given set number of days or a, a, a given set number of SKUs that then there's rules. There's usually rules in the buyer's ERP about when they aggregate together, when they get to a sufficient number of needing to buy across a sufficient number of SKUs and a sufficient volume, that will trigger off the generation of a bulk PO. And then once that rule is hit, it, it oftentimes will need to be reviewed by a procurement officer or something like that that basically rubber stamps that cool okay the, the po has been automatically generated by the system yep let's authorize that and then boom that fires off and generates the so in the seller's system okay so that's that's the primary purpose of edi and it, and it, and that's why only the biggest buyers will typically require EDI because they just cannot do, they, they potentially have hundreds of suppliers or potentially thousands of suppliers with potentially millions of SKUs. And so the ability to completely manually manage purchasing at scale is just, it's not doable. It's just not possible. And as a result of that, they want, they have some form of automation on their side, that gets shunted down the EDI pipeline into all their supplier systems, and it all just happens. And, and then the strategic buying on the buyer side is all about, okay, do we keep a supplier? Do we find a new supplier? Do we rotate suppliers? Do we have multiple suppliers for a given SKU? Um, so for example, we may have multiple three, four distributors that supply the product. And if one's out, then we'll send this, the order to another one. We, we Maybe we check prices uh, across all of those suppliers before we create the PO and send it off by EDI. So there's a number of different rule sets inside the buying org that will dictate how and when and where they generate orders, but really they become more strategic and then they set the rules in their system around that SKU, set of SKUs, supplier, whatever it might be. They set a strategic rule set around how they engage with that supplier and how they do purchasing with that supplier. And oftentimes it's also... Uh, usually the ERP will also have a demand planning module. And so supplier performance or supplier product availability, shipping times, delays, et cetera, shipping costs, depending on how far in advance you place your order, et cetera, this will auto oftentimes, they'll oftentimes have guardrails around the rules that they have, the generic rule set that they have. And then they will have supplier specific influences on that, depending on all those things that I just talked about. And so oftentimes those rules will be overridden by supplier specific engagement criteria that then will dictate how often they place orders with that supplier and how they place orders with that supplier. And sometimes the supplier will dictate, okay, unless you can place an order of $1,000 or $5,000 or 1,000 units or whatever it is, the, the supplier will oftentimes have rules around the types of orders and the quantity and the frequency and the yearly spend and all that sort of stuff. They will have rules too that will be implemented on the buyer's system to make sure they fall within those rules and meet those minimum order requirements, for example, or incremental buying requirements, whatever the supplier has across their catalog. All those rules will be layered on top. So there's three general sets of rules that often apply in a buyer's ERP. There's the generic rule, you know, the generic min maxes that they might have and all the other rules that they have across and the stockholding rules by location and all those different things that will sit in there. They'll oftentimes have their demand planning module adding supplier specific automated rules and then they will have the supplier rules layered on top. So there's usually a minimum of three sets of rules on the buying side in the ERP to be able to generate these automated orders that then flow automatically via EDI to the supplier. 
Then we have, when we move down in scale of buyer to that mid-tier buyer or mid-enterprise buyer, then oftentimes they'll have an, a, what's called an e-procurement system that is independent of their ERP. It might be integrated with their ERP, but it's a standalone procurement platform that allows for what's called punch-out integration with a supplier. And, and that, uh, what that does is it allows in real time when they spool up their procurement system and they want to make a purchase with a specific supplier, in real time it connects to the supplier's cataloging system that they make available via this punch out. And again, there's usually dedicated punch out middleware technology. There's a platform called Trade Centric, and there's a few different punch out platforms that provide that middleware connectivity between a supplier's catalog and a buyer's e procurement system. And it pulls down in real time the catalog, it pulls down in real time their pricing, it pulls all that stuff down in real time. They generate the order inside their e-procurement system, and then it is sent back to the supplier. And usually that middleware will then create that order inside of either the seller's ERP or inside the seller's e-commerce platform and translate it into an automated web order, almost like EDI, but it's really almost like RPA. It's more like RPA in the sense that it then converts that e-procurement PO order into an order inside the supplier's e-commerce platform of choice. Then we have self-service e-commerce, and that's for everybody else. Anybody who doesn't do EDI, anybody who doesn't have an e-procurement or punch-out technology or system, uh, then everybody else would log in to an e-commerce platform as a buyer. They see their price list. They see their restricted catalog. They see all the things that they're supposed to see. They see their credit limits. They can see their invoices, statements, etc. And then they place their order at will, either manually browsing, searching, adding to cart, uh, replicating previous orders, or usually in a e-commerce platform, there is the ability to upload a CSV. Uh, the the customer can upload a CSV of their order. They might have a hundred lines on that order, whatever it is. Upload that CSV through the front end, through a widget, through an upload widget that then populates the cart en mass, and then all they have to do is check out from there. And they usually have their own unique payment methods available to them by customer and their own credit limits by customer, et cetera. So those are the, the that, that's how, that's what EDI is. And then that, that's how it fits into the pantheon of purchase options or purchase channel options in the B2B world. Does that kind of all make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Depending on the different customers they have and how often they purchased and, and the complexity of the purchasing process, you want to provide the multiple channels to be able to make those purchases from Absolutely nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. EDI is the old school way, but it's still exceptionally popular. I think I think studies from DC 360 show something like, I think something like 40% or more of B2B transactions in it from a digital commerce perspective are EDI in the B2B world. So it's still, it's not going away anytime soon. I, I, I want to follow up on that. So when you say old school, do you mean that in five, 10 years, you expect that companies are not going to be using EDI? Because from what you make it sound like when it comes to the automation that comes behind EDI, that's still relevant, right? Unless you, you had that automation within within the commerce solution, you still have to continue leveraging EDI. So it doesn't sound like it's it's a, it's going to be a legacy anytime soon. Like it's just like the automations are valuable. It, it It is and it isn't in the sense that it's you can't personalize the EDI experience like you can a self-service e-commerce experience. You can't you can't cross-sell, you can't upsell, you're not capturing like the zero and first party data that you get to collect through self-service e-commerce. There's there there are downsides even for the buyer. There are downsides in the sense that you cannot create this hyper personalized journey for them. You can't you cannot create this this shopping journey for them that allows you to merchandise special promotions you might be having. doesn't allow you to merchandise. It's a very clinical, very – because it's completely computer-driven, it is – you rely much more. In an EDI-mediated order scenario, it, th there is a much more of a reliance on the sales rep to do the individual personalized selling into the buyer brand. So there, there's much more – there's almost a constant requirement to have constant reaching out, constant emails, constant attachments, constant. There's this, there's this huge overhead for both buyer and seller. So you might have the category manager on the buyer side dealing with the sales rep on the seller side.
And so there is this constant negotiation, trade terms, catalogs, like it's, there's just, there's a lot of overhead that is not accounted for, I think, oftentimes both on the buyer and the seller side. There's a lot of human overheads that they think, oh, well, we're, we're doing EDI and it's scalable and it's easy and it's amazing. And that's true in many respects. But what isn't calculated in that is the overhead of the human component because we are not automating the sales and merchandising process as we do through self-service e-commerce. So we can create a completely guided CPQ-driven buyer journey through a self-service e-commerce website. We can create amazing customer experiences, am hyper-personalized customer experiences in that way through the search, merch, and, and personalization technologies that are available out there today. We can do amazing things through that that mean a, a sales rep, the overhead, the load on the sales rep drops dramatically in, in a self-service e-commerce environment. So I absolutely think there's room for both, but EDI is not going away anytime soon, despite the fact that from an experiential perspective, it's completely sanitary because it's one system talking to another system, but you still need that human layer to facilitate the transaction, even though the plumbing is automated computer to computer. So there's pros and cons to EDI for sure. Gotcha, absolutely. I know we have a few more minutes left, so maybe there's time for yeah, one. Yeah, let's get into it, man. I've got a bit extra time for you today. Gotcha. I, I have another meeting in, in a few minutes. Sure. Let me skip to, to my last question. So. What type of skills would you say someone needs to have when they're entering the B2B e-commerce implementation space? Is it important for them to be able to do integrations? Because I know that's going to be important. Like, how, what would your thoughts be around that? So are you talking mainly like from an agency perspective? If they were to get, if it was an agency doing e-commerce implementations and they were specifically wanting to focus on the B2B e-commerce implementation space, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I think there's multiple skill sets that are usually required. You have to have really good solution architects. You have to have really good BAs. The design capability, like UI, UX capabilities, are typically much lower requirements in the B2B space versus the B2C and D2C space, where you're primarily dealing with marketers, where they want everything to be pixel perfect. And I like to say, I've coined this term. In the B2C, D2C world, it's function over form. In the B2B world, it's, sorry, in the B2C, D2C world, it is form over function. It's function over form in the B2B world, meaning that the UI, UX, like it's like the branding and the, all the little elements that you never hear a B2B brand, whether it's manufacturer, wholesaler, distributor, whatever it might be. Whenever I've been helping them architect their e-commerce solution, I never hear them say, oh, we want to look like Apple. We want to create a customer experience like the Apple website. You never hear these kind of statements, but you hear it a lot in the B2C and D2C world. They're trying to, they're cry there's a lot more artistic requirements creative requirements in the B2C and D2C world because they're trying to create a brand feeling. They're trying to create a brand experience. Whereas in the B2B world, we're trying to remove as much friggin' friction as possible because the buyers are buying as part of their job. They're, they're not doing it for pleasure or fun or entertainment or inspiration. They're buying because they bloody well have to for their job. So we're trying to get the hell out of the way and let them buy as quickly and easily as possible. And so Oftentimes, agencies that maybe come from a heavy DDC, BDC background, they really struggle to pivot and start to take on some of these larger, more complex B2B e-commerce projects because they're so heavily focused on design, UI, UX, and lightweight functionality that all of a sudden now they get into the B2B world and they go, holy crap, we got a whole bunch of new stuff to think about. So you, you need people – that have a deep expertise and understanding of the nuance of selling in the B2B world. And that starts right as early on as the discovery. So, so my discovery when so I do service some D2C brands and some B2C brands, but it's heavily weighted towards B2B. And usually the only D2C brands or B2C brands I work with are B2B brands that are trying to establish a D2C channel or D2C brands that are trying to establish a B2B channel. So there's usually some sort of overlap with B2B there. That's how they come to be connected with me. But my discovery for a B2B project is radically and radically different than it is for a discovery for a D2C project. It, it, like the, some of the questions are the same. I would say there's maybe a 25% overlap, 
but the rest is, is totally different because we're much more concerned about business process on the B2B side. We're much more concerned about CPQ. We're much more concerned about fulfillment. We're much more concerned about warehousing and where that, like we're, we're much more co concerned about their existing stack in the way that they're currently engaging with B2B customers. We're much more concerned about, okay, how, what does your price list look like? What is your, what, what is, how does your sales team currently engage with customers and how do we support that? There's from an operational perspective, it's significantly more complex in the B2B world. And whereas operationally in the B2C, DDC world, it's much more straightforward. The stacks are much more consistent. The design patterns are much more consistent. So those are some of the key differences I would say is that if you as an agency want to start delivering projects with B2B platforms, specifically to B2B merchants, you are probably going to have to bring in somebody like me or somebody from the B2B world to help you understand those nuances, subtleties, and complexities of the B2B world. Otherwise, it's going to be, it's going to be really hard to win deals because if you speak the language only of B2C and D2C and then you try to get into discovery with a B2B brand, they're going to they're gonna sniff you out straight away that you have no credibility because you're not even using the same language that they use. And I'll just use one example. So in the B2B world, it's not called click and collect. It's called will call. So if you, say, if you use the term click and collect – for collecting from a warehouse or a physical retail store in B2B, they're going to look at you like you grew two heads. They're going to be like, no, it's will call. That's what we do in B2B. It's, it's an equivalent concept, but the language is just so different. Everything in the B2B world, the language, the lingo, the, you, it's just really hard to garner respect from a B2B brand unless you're speaking their language in ways that they can understand it to where you don't sound condescending to them. And those would be some of the things to think about. Then from a technical perspective, if you've only ever worked with Shopify, for example, as a B2C or D2C agency, you're going to need to take on some specialist B2B platforms that you can upskill in and build a practice around because Shopify is not going to get it done for 90% of your clients. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click Get Mentored by Jason.